Welcome to the first episode of the Fast LED podcast. Today we are going to talk about polar coordinates and what's interesting about them. Very specifically, what they are, how you get them, what you can do to them, and once you're done with them, how to convert them back into Cartesian coordinates. Why is this interesting? Basically, thinking and calculating in a polar system unlocks a bunch of interesting animations. Namely, rotation, what you see right here. Additionally, all kind of kaleidoscopes and mirrored effects. Beyond this, it allows spirals and here some multi-layer stuff where kaleidoscope and spiral comes together but also effects like up here this lens effect or here this hoover effect or this stuff which looks a bit like ripples so, this is why it's totally worth to know about it. And I suggest let's dive right in. Teaser first, we will talk about all the math and all the background. And at the end, you will understand or hopefully see why these four simple formulas here are everything you need in order to realize all these creative animations. But let's start at the beginning. Usually you work in a Cartesian coordinate system. A Cartesian system basically has an origin and it has two axes. And these axes are perpendicular to each other. And within that system, you can address every single point in this plane by naming the two coordinates. And the one coordinate is the distance on the x-axis. And the other one is the distance on the y-axis. So this is how you usually talk to your LED metrics or how you address every single pixel in your setup. So you, I guess you are familiar with that one. Right. Unlike this two-dimensional coordinate system, there's a different one. And this is polar coordinate system. There you also have an origin and you have a reference line. Let's make that a bit bigger. So in that system, every point here, the two red ones, is defined by a distance from the origin and by an angle to the reference line. So you see here that point has a length of 3, angle of 60 degree. That point is apparently further away from the origin, so the distance is bigger. Here they call it 4 and the angle 210 degree. This is also a two-dimensional system and basically allows you to address every single point in the plane by just naming a distance and an angle. Let's talk about the angle a bit and where this is coming from. You might remember from school that there are 
different ways to measure the angle. You might be familiar to count it for a full circle in degrees, meaning from 0 to 360 degrees. Or you can count it in radian. If we have here a circle with a radius of 1. The circle then the radians are basically a function of the circumference, meaning 1, 2, 3 is nearly half a circle, half a circle is pi radian, and the full circle is 2 radian, so 2 radian equals 360 degree. Keep that in mind for later. Here I found a different interactive picture where basically I can manipulate the distance, right? Everything along this line and I can manipulate the angle. So you see Every single point in this plane, let's try to get down here, every single point in this plane can be described just by a distance and by an angle. All right, after this is clear, let's see how we convert Cartesian into polar. So let's go back to a simple case where we are in that quadrant of the system. Let's say we are here at, I don't know, four point something. Let's say we go for... Hmm, three and five roughly. So we have the Cartesian coordinates, the x part and the y part, and now we somehow need to find out what is the distance and what is the angle. How do we go about that? Let's start with the distance. From school, you might remember a thing called the Pythagorean theorem. Basically, it talks about right angled triangles. So, here is a right angle. And in essence, it says the square of this side plus the square of this side equals the square of the long side. What do we do with that? You might see a similarity here between this triangle and this virtual triangle, just that it's mirrored. So right angle would be here. Oh no, it's not mirrored, it's the same. The right angle is here. And basically, horizontally, there is the x. In this picture, it's called a. And vertically, it's y, which is here called b. So far, so good. So we can take this simple equation here and solve it for c. Right, so we take the square root on both sides, and the result is that c equals the square root of a square plus b square. We have this here. This is all we need to know to find out the distance of the point 
to the original, to the origin in a polar system. And if we come back to the spoiler picture from the beginning, this is exactly this formula here. Here the distance is called r, and r is the square root from x square plus y square. So, first part is solved. We know the length, and now we need to find out the angle. In order to find out this angle, we are going to use trigonometric functions. Let's have a look at this drawing again, which is very similar to that one. We care about this angle here, right? And so far we know that the right angle triangle here has here a length of x has here a length of y, and we already found out that it has here a distance according to the formula we just spoke about. So now, how to get to the angle? We will use something called trigonometric functions. The wiki article is here. And in this picture, you basically see the same thing. We wonder about this angle here at A. In the right angle triangle, by definition, the opposite side is called the opposite. Then the short line here is adjacent. And the longest one is the hypotenuse. And there are certain relations which work in our favor. For example, if you look here, the sine of this angle is by definition the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So we could use that alone for reconstructing the angle. But you see a problem already. In case the hypotenuse is zero, meaning in case the distance of the point is zero, then we would end up dividing by zero and the thing explodes. So not so cool. Let's try something different. We could also use the cosine function in order to get to this angle, to calculate this angle, and this is by definition the adjacent, so x divided by the distance, c. Same problem. If we divide by zero, it doesn't work. Damn it. Let's try something else. How about tangent? By definition, the tangent of that angle here is the opposite divided by adjacent. Hmm. Looks like there's a problem in case the x distant becomes zero. So if adjacent is zero, it doesn't work. Hmm. Looks like we have to handle some edge cases here in order to prevent the division by zero and avoid this problem. We will come to it. We will come to it. Before we solve the riddle, let's look at these plots here how the sine and the cosine function are related to a point on the circle. Look at this beauty. If we rotate a point around the center, so describing a circle, and at every given time we plot here 
x and here y. Cartesian x and Cartesian y. You see, we end up with two functions that look very, very similar, basically identical, only difference is that the cosine function is phase shifted to the sine function. So you might want to keep this in mind for later when we are going to convert back, but we come to it. But just to have a visual representation what we talk about here and, and how that relates to geometry. How is it with the, with the tangent function? There it looks a bit more elaborate. Let that one sink in. We are only interested here in the dark red graph, which describes here the tangent. And you see it's all going fine, except the angle here is 90 degree or 270 degree. Zero coming to 90 and you see bump it explodes. And there again and at 270 degree bump it explodes. So this function is not defined for 90 or 270 degree which translates to pi half or 3 pi half. Again, looks like we have to handle edge cases by hand. Beside this, tangent seems to work, except for those two specific angles. So, how to get the damn angle? We are going to use inverse trigonometric functions. Like so far, we spoke about the relations in the triangle and the definition that tangents of the angle is the relation between the, the sides in the triangle. And now we want to calculate back to the angle, like what is the actual angle. And for that, we use the inverse trigonometric function, which basically by definition is one divided by it. And in our case, that would be the arcus tangent function. And you see here again, we have a problem with the, with the range of the function that it's just defined between minus pi half and, and plus pi half. So again, we have to consider edge cases, which makes the function a bit bulky. This is not good. Like we could do this, yeah? We could do this by basically having a look in which quadrant we are. If we are here and that, and that, and that, or on that. And by having a look if we are here at 90 degree or at 270 degree and handle all that cases differently. But luckily, there is a more elegant way to get this angle from a specific arcus tangens function. And that function is called a102. And you won't believe it, this function first appeared in the programming language Fortran in 1968. It was originally intended to return a correct and unambiguous value for the angle in converting from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. So apparently someone had this problem before us and solved it. And basically that does the edge case handling internally returns us a function that looks like that which is defined everywhere, doesn't explode anywhere, and this allows us to reconstruct the angle here in a very, very easy way. So basically, we just give it 
the Y part from the Cartesian system and the X part from the Cartesian system and it returns us the angle. It's really simple as this. So here you see again the, the distance of the point as here the, the square root of the sum of the squares. We had this before and the angle we are looking for is the result of that function. So back to the spoiler here. The angle is this function and can very easily access this function directly in the Arduino IDE or in processing or whatever your the language is you're using. So this is a quite standard mass function. Nice. So let's now have a look into converting the polar coordinates back into Cartesian coordinates. And for understanding this, let's have a look again at this animation here. As I said before, the X coordinate in the Cartesian system of the circle, the X coordinate is described by a cosine function. And the Y coordinate, zip, that one here, is here plotted in the, with the red graph, and this is a sine function. So this is all we need to know. We have an angle, here the yellow one, we have the distance, like the distance from the green spot to the origin, and in order to convert it back to Cartesian, we just need to multiply the cosine of the angle with the length and the sine of the angle with the length. So if you have a look here, x is r, which I called distance before, multiplied by the cosine and y is distance multiplied by the sign. Sure, you could have googled that in the first place, but I'm, I'm trying to really make the geometry and the math behind understandable, because later it will be beneficial to, uh, to have a clear picture why all this is and where it comes from. So, conclusion. We started with Cartesian x and y. We explained what polar is, distance and angle. We spoke about converting Cartesian to polar. With the formula for the distance, have the formula for the angle. Here they are. This function here is just defined in a very small range. So instead of inverse tangents, we went for arcos tangents 2. And to convert it back, meaning we have already distance and angle, we just multiply it here with the distance. Oh boy, that took way longer than I expected. So I guess that's enough for the first video. I'm totally aware that I repeated myself. I'm aware of my funny pronunciation, of my weird accent, of my cadence and timing I need to work on. But instead of trying to be perfect on the first try, I dare to leave you with that here and now and will do my very best to have the next one a bit more compact and this is then really about the fun part where we manipulate the angle and the distance and create all this stuff you see right here 
Also, I'm aware that the audio quality is a bit poor here, and this is because I recorded this just on the laptop. An external microphone is ordered and on the way to my home, so I hope the next one will sound better. But I challenged myself to not postpone everything into the future until the conditions are better and just start with what I have right now in order to get this project going. So, you know the YouTube game. Like, subscribe, comment, share if you want to support this channel to grow and if you want to see and hear more content like this, it would be highly appreciated if you let the algorithm know. I'm looking forward to your feedback. If you have any questions or remarks, I'm really looking forward to hear and read all of that. And I'm already excited for the next one. Wishing you all a good week. See you next time. Bye.